Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We're in Reno, Nevada. Interbike is happening uh, this week in Reno. It's a big, huge bike show. They have stuff up at the mountains. They've got stuff at the convention center. This is a small side of it, put on by Royal Dutch Gazelle uh, Bikes, a 125-year-old bike company that is all in on electric bikes. We came because this e-bike story and part of the big motors, or excuse me, little motors, big battery, kind of last mile thing has really taken off. So we want to come get a better feel for what's going on. And we're excited to have a dealer from Portland, one of the most bike friendly uh, towns in all the U.S. He's Wake Greg, and he runs the e-bike store. Wake, great to see you. Great, thank you very much. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So you said you've had your store open for 10 years? 10 years. We were the first all-electric store to open in Portland. Actually, it was part of an MBA project. I was in China taking a class, saw electric bikes for the first time, gas had just spiked, and realized these are the most efficient form of motorized transportation known. Right. And nobody was doing it. And so next class I had to write a business plan, Launched it 10 years ago by putting 25,000 on a credit card and borrowed 10,000 from a friend. And 10 years later, we're still here. Love it, love it's, the um, story. It's been, it's been a fun ride. So it's just, you know, you're the second retailer we've had on and, and, and they were also exclusive e-bikes in the Bay Area. So, you know, was the, the kind of existing bike infrastructure, attitude, you know, industry, just looking down to these on these things, were they just too weird, too new? Why, you know, kind of the early well, ones are e-bikes only. What's interesting, if you come to the market right now, what you see is you see some of the largest companies in the world putting a lot of resources, engineering resources, manufacturing resources, testing resources behind e-bikes. Back in the day, it wasn't such. You know, these manufacturers make them, and the kind of the customer was the test person. Right. And so it's been a very bumpy road to get to this point, but at this point, they're very reliable. And so at first, when, when shops were, were brought these things, they said, why would I ever carry that? Who can keep it running? You know, and now it's at the point where they're very easy to keep running. They have log files. You plug it into the computer if you have a problem with it, and it tells you, oh, error code. Right. Fix this one thing, and right. off you're going again. But it hasn't always been such. And so the older bike shops in particular avoided them because you make your money in a bike shop by having a customer for life. And they couldn't keep them running, so they were nervous they would not be able to keep the customer. Right. And it was, it was wise. You know, now it's at the point where all the IBDs are coming in. In Portland right now, we have seven electric-only bike shops. All the big IBDs are carrying it. What's IBD? But, uh, independent bike dealer. Okay. And on top of that, um, half the people when they're looking for an e-bike will not buy from a traditional bike shop. They'll only come to an e-bike specialist. And so that's kind of our niche is the people. And we really focus on that. So right. we try to have all of our how we explain things, not to use big bike terms, we talk about how it would value the customer and use a whole different lingo than a traditional bike shop. Right, so you know, there's a lot of different things going on with bikes. So one sure. of them, right, is the speed um, and then and, and how it's classified. So, yes. you know, there's the kind of the 20 mile an hour yep. limit and we see that in the scooters and all these electric vehicles that keep it not a motor vehicle. And then they've got one here, I think it was 27 or 28 miles yes, per class hour. three. Class three. So the laws seem to be kind of trying to catch up. Like, how do we classify these things? Are they bikes? Are they allowed on the bike well, path? Are they not allowed on the bike path? So how do it's you, funny you bring that up today. that evolve? Well, it's funny you bring that up today because just today, Bike Portland, which is one of the biggest bike blogs in the nation, um, came out with an article saying they were really looking in the fine print of, or of Portland code, my city's code, and found out you can't ride an e-bike on the city paths and the city parks. And I didn't know this. I've been in business 10 years, but the very fine print and under interpretation, you can't do it. Um, so it is, it's a gray space. Um, the 28 mile an hour bikes, well it seems crazy fast when you and I are standing here. When you're on a road and there's a backup of cars behind you where it's a 20 mile an hour speed limit and they're driving 25, right? You know, it feels kind of safer to be able to go 25 with them and not hold them up and be able to get away from the dooring zone where your car isn't going to open its door in you by taking the lane. It feels much safer. So I actually, you know, I ride a class one most of the time, but I, I do like riding class three bikes. Right. Just curious in terms of, of the change of experience on an e-bike versus a regular bike, some of the customers that you have, how is it sure, fundamentally so, different? Because, I, you know, I came into here today thinking this is really a last mile play. It's not a last no. mile play at so all. So for us, about 35% of our customers, their e-bike is their main mode of transportation. It is their car. It is how they get around. And about 20% historically from our shop have been people with physical disabilities or limitations in some way, shape, or form. 20%. 20%. So it's people who can no longer make it up the hill to their house. It's people who can't arrive at work sweaty. It's people with MS, people who are missing a lung, um, people who have COPD, um, you name it. These are people who now can ride again and getting them active again. And so it's a whole different mindset. Um, historically, the bike industry has really gone after kind of the elite athlete. Right. 
And this is something different. It's people who have, may haven't ridden a bike for oftentimes 20 plus years right. are now able to get out and go on a hill. And the most interesting thing, they did a study in Australia where they put, um, they worked with cyclists who've been injured and they hooked them up to exercise bikes in front of a video screen showing them, you know, as they're pedaling down the road essentially. And they changed the video to climb a hill, but they didn't change the settings on the exercise bike they were sitting on. The cyclists reported a higher level of pain when the visual showed them climbing the hill. So e-bikes do the exact reverse of that. And you're actually rewiring your brain so that bikes don't add pain and you can get where you need to go easily and efficiently. Right. So it's their primary, their primary method. So you talk about the connectivity. Um, you know, an app integrated uh, experience with all these devices we see over and over. So how has that changed the experience? Are you, is it, is it app for the consumer in terms of they're keeping track of their miles? Is it just for you and the maintenance? Or, well, you know, how's the integration so of an app working? There are a few different ways of the app. So there's a mechanics app where we can plug it in and see the error codes. Um, and that's important because back in the day, someone would come in and say, I rode this thing at, at mile 25, it cut out and stopped working. So after work, you know, we go out and ride 25 miles and try to see if we could recreate the issue. And it was a pain. Now. Well, you just told me it wasn't a pain to ride 25 no, miles. No, this is back in the day. <laughs> okay. It was a pain to try to fall. So intermittent issues are the bane of oh, my yes, existence. Yes, yes. But the, uh, having a log file, we just plug it in and says, oh, it cut out because of this error code, you know, and boom, okay, replace the speed sensor. Good, you're back up and rolling. Right. Especially with people who commute, they, they don't want to leave their bike in the shop. They want it ready within 24 hours or less. And so it's got to be turned. Right. And so it's a whole different form of mechanics and a whole different level of support from the bike dealers. And that's why we choose the bike lines we choose, like Gazelle, right. who support their products very well. So it's pretty interesting, as you said, it, you know, uh, we, we talked about the scooter space and one wheels and all that fun stuff. So many of those companies were started with Kickstarter. It's amazing to me how many kind of Kickstarter projects actually turned into real companies. Boosted, Future Motion well, being a couple of my favorites. Future Motion, actually, the, the, the design behind it was the guy who first invented the self-balancing unicycle. It's Daniel Wood. He's actually from Clack, or from yeah, Clackamas, right across the river from Portland. And so I tried his original version of the self-balancing unicycle, which they made their first one wheels from. And that, you know, it's come a long way in, there, in the, in the uh, one wheel, but it's been a fascinating progression to watch him right. bring that out to But me. that's very different than a 125-year-old Dutch company that's been making mics, been oh. making these bikes for 100 plus years. Really, it's funny. We have, I think there's seven models here that they're showing today. Yes. I asked the, the, the Gazelle guys how many regular bikes models do you have? And they're like, one. Yeah. <laughs> so, so they're all in. I mean, this and, is significant. And you think about some of the biggest companies in the world. Market cap, Bosch is always one of the top five to 10 market companies in the world. They make the largest, the best selling system in, in the United States right. and in Europe. Right. And they're behind it. They have millions of lithium batteries in people's homes already through their power tool division. They're, the kind of engineering they're bringing is staggering. And it's been really fun to be part of an industry that has been so nascent and yet just boom, right. overnight, it just comes up right before you, right. before your eyes. Okay, so I got to ask you about the weather. You're from yeah. Portland, yes. it rains a lot in Portland, it rains a lot in, in, in Holland. How does the rain impact these things? Obviously, you just said no. it's their primary vehicle. Is it, is it more dangerous? Is there more spray? Is it, so is it a factor this or is, is it just where, not a factor? This is where the lines you carry make a huge difference. So when you, if, you carry, if you buy one off the internet that hasn't been product tested, you are the product tester. If you buy one like this, they literally have like a saltwater steam bath. They put the bikes in for weeks to simulate marine corrosion. They have hydraulic machines that beat the tar out of them. And so when you get a product, it just works. Um, and so we've had a, we had a Bosch system go completely underwater. Now I'm not saying this is going to happen for everybody's experience. We had a guy literally put the bike in a river. He went one way, the bike went another. <laughs> not on purpose. It, no, not on purpose. <laughs> it was underwater for a few minutes. Right, right. It worked and rode home. And about a week later, it made some noises, and we told Bosch what happened. It was not a warranty issue, it was a collision. And Bosch said, you know, we haven't had enough warranty claims. We have some extra motors. We're going to send you a new one. And the guy still uses his daily commuter. Right. Um, and it works great. Right. So, so it, you, rain does not affect them, but it really depends on the model you have and how much proc testing and how much engineering has gone in behind it to right. make sure you have the experience. Because right. lithium and water are not generally friends. No. <laughs> so. so just I'll give you the last word. Yep. When you talk to people that are new to the space, maybe they just stumbled into the store, they, they heard about these e-bike things. What's kind of the biggest surprise that you see time and time again when people get one of these things and bring it home? Number one is that it rides like a bike. You can just go further. Um, it's how well integrated they are. Um, 
on average, an e-bike has ridden 75% more than a traditional bike. 75% more? 75% more. Um, on average, you can go about, well, the average speed-wise on it, um, I just saw a study on this today, you know, you can increase your time by an average, average cycle's averaging 11 miles an hour. Average e-bike averages about 13 to 14, 15, around there. And I forget the exact number, so I'm giving a bit of right, gray right. area there. A but, little bit faster. Yeah. Um, and so it gets you where you're going faster with less sweat. Right. Well, Wake, thanks for, uh, for, for taking it's a minute. What a, it's, oh, it's, a, it's a cool story, and you know, Portland obviously is leading the charge in this, in this whole transformation. It's been a fun place to be, and <laughs> our customers are just awesome. All right. No two ways about it. Super. Well, thanks again. Thank you. He's Wake. I'm Jeff. You're Thank watching you. The Cube. We're at the Royal Dutch Gazelle bike event at Interbike. Thanks for watching. Thank you.